everyone. I'm Linda Nickel, and welcome to the Happiness Hour. My goal here is to help us all connect, inspire, and create. Every week, someone new joins me to share a bit of inspiration, creativity, and their passion for photography. The list of upcoming presentations can be found on my website at lindanickel.com. Under Happiness Hour, you'll find the links to my YouTube channel and our community blog. Elaine Pruden is here to help me troubleshoot any technical glitches and to gently remind me to stay focused. Elaine is the content editor of the Happiness Hour community blog. If you're interested in contributing an article, please take a look at the invitation on my website. Say hello, Elaine. Hello, everybody. Good to see you. So my guests tonight are Mika Geiger and Barbara Vance. Mika is a macro photographer who is fascinated by the small critters that she finds in her garden and on her daily walks. Mika's images capture the universe of tiny creatures and delicate botanicals nestled within the larger landscapes around us. Mika was recently named Sony's Alpha Female Plus Macro Contest winner. You can find her fine art and abstract images on her website at mikageiger.com. In tonight's presentation, Photographing Our Hidden World, Mika will share her approach and tips to help you discover intriguing insects and how to best photograph them in your garden and beyond. She will discuss the equipment she finds most useful, ways to deal with shy or tricky subjects, and some strategies to, de to develop the backgrounds and angles that will bring out the most in your tiny subjects. But before you can photograph your subjects, you have to get them into your garden. And for this part of the presentation, Mika has partnered with master gardener, Barbara Vance, who studied horticulture and landscape architecture. Barbara has been a certified Texas master gardener for 25 years. So she'll be able to offer suggestions to create a garden which welcomes wings and wonders, plants for pollinators, hints for a healthy garden, and she'll offer some resources that will help you identify plants that will do well in your part of the country. Barbara is also an accomplished photographer that was recently recognized for her nature photography. And you can find Barbara on Instagram at bobc3. So ladies, welcome to the happiness hour. Um, so if, you, if anybody's been here a time or two, you may have heard me say, I joke about this all the time. This really should be Linda's selfish hour because this is my opportunity to ask people to come on and teach me things that I've been wanting to learn. And um, so this is this is kind of one of those. Uh, let me start over and just say Mika and Barbara have been attending the Happiness Hour for a long time. We're, we're almost at a year with this little project. And they sit there quietly and they're nice and they make comments and they support the other presenters. And recently I just said, why don't you guys do a presentation? And I, I didn't have to fight one of them, but I did have to fight and kind of, you know, coerce Mika into doing this. So um, I'm just, I'm super excited to have both of you say yes. And, and I'm really, really so honored that that you trusted me enough to come on and, and do this. So with that, let's start with you, Barbara. Uh, tell me, I, I, I kind of know what a master gardener is, but for those in the room that don't, tell me what that is. Tell me how you became one. And is that something that's, is that just a Texas only thing or is it, can we find other master gardeners in other parts of the country? Well, you can find one master gardener in the, in the group tonight because Jenny Makeda is a master gardener in South Carolina. Yes, I didn't know that. There are master gardener groups all around the country. And it's a, in, in Texas, we're affiliated with Texas A&M. So we go through a training program, but we're actually meant to be volunteer educators for, in gardening for our communities. So I uh, went through the program in 96 have been at it a long time. And so you go through pretty intensive training and then there's recurrent training too. But then we, we do volunteer projects uh, in gardening education. So that's kind of what it's all about. And, and there's a lot that, that we don't know. There's too much about gardening for any one person to know everything. But Master Gardener Program really helps you find out where to find the answers. It's kind of the way I look at it. 
Okay. Well, I feel very fortunate to, um, because you're in my phone, I can text you and just say, Hey, so I'm, 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 I'm super, super excited about that. Okay. So let's just get into your part of the presentation. So if you... as, as Linda said, I've, I've been uh, gardening for a long time. I do. Uh, I'm sure there are people here who know more about gardening, insects and photography than I do, but I'm happy to share what I know. Um, my garden is usually a buzz with all sorts of winged creatures. So I uh, hopefully know a little bit and can share it. And if I don't know, maybe I can find out for you. But uh, I do know that if you if you grow them, they will come. So I promise you that. So hopefully I can share with you some the kinds of plants to include and other things to create a healthy habitat in your own backyard to attract the critters. Um, I know you're here because you want to learn to photograph the insects. But I'm also going to share some reasons why, of, uh, other good reasons why it's helpful to attract insects to your garden, besides just photographing them. Probably the main one is pollination. 75% of our food crops are dependent upon pollination. Some of that comes from wind, of course, but most of it comes from bees and other pollinators. So anytime you can take care of the bees and pollinators, then it's going to help the world at large. So pollination is a good reason to attract insects and give them a healthy habitat. Natural pest control is another good reason. This cute dragonfly is a natural predator. It eats bugs, including mosquitoes. So we love dragonflies. And uh, pesticides, of course, are a threat to insects. So anytime you can use less pesticides, okay, why did that go away? Uh, less pesticides and more natural control, including natural predators, you're just creating a better balance in your yard and a better environment, healthier environment for all concerned. And soil improvement is another reason to attract them. Earthworms aerate the soil and create uh, their worm castings fertilize the soil. A lot of insects lay their eggs and even pupate in the soil. So that aerates and adds organic matter to the soil. So, but know that you're helping in a lot of other ways when you attract insects to your garden. I think we'd all agree that a ladybug or lady beetle is a good bug. They are natural predators, natural pest control, and they're really cute and fun to photograph. So I think we'd all consider them to be a good bug. Well, what do you think about this little guy? Pretty cute, but he's going to grow into a great big plant eating grasshopper. You may disagree with me, but I consider a grasshopper to be a bad bug. <laughs> Pesticides are not discriminatory. So anytime you use a pesticide, to try to get rid of bad bugs, you're gonna kill some good ones in the process. So my recommendation is to use as little pesticides as possible, trying to attract the natural predators. And if you really need pesticides, use the least harmful possible. Use the most organic, most natural method and target those just that area that is really having the problem. Don't use a, a broad spectrum, widespread pesticide if you can, because we uh, really need to help them along and not use pesticides if we can help it. There are a lot of threats to insect life these days, one being pesticides. So we've kind of worked that to death. I won't go into it anymore, but the least, less you can use in, of pesticides, the better off the insects will be. Invasive species are, is something you really need to pay attention to as you're planting. Every area where you live, different areas have different invasive species list. What might be invasive for me might not be for you, but kudzu in the American South comes to mind and closer to home in Central Texas, Nandina and Ligustrum are widely used as suburban landscape plants. They produce berries the birds love the berries and we know what birds do when they eat the berries. They deposit those seeds anywhere they choose, hither and yon. So let's say there's a hillside or a woodland area that has been full of a variety of native plants, attracting all sorts of insects and wildlife. The birds deposit these invasives, Nandina, 
Lagusta different ones. And those can actually just completely take over that native area and smother out the native plants. So the wildlife and insects have lost that habitat. So do not plant invasive species. I'm just gonna tell you that you can find lists of what is invasive in your area and avoid those plants, please. Loss of habitat is a threat to insects. And I just mentioned one loss of habitat when an invasive species takes over. Another loss of habitat is development might take over a prairie or a ranch area that previously had a lot of native species in it that the wildlife was dependent upon. So anytime you can choose a plant that has been lost to development or invasive species, then you're really helping the insects. So choose those kinds of plants rather than the invasive species. And of course, we have to mention climate change, um, won't dwell on it, but it is another problem that the insects are having. So how can you host a healthy habitat? Obviously the insects need food and we're gonna talk about nectar plants, but I also want to focus on host plants that may or may not have entered your realm of thinking. This is a uh, swallowtail caterpillar on fennel. The swallowtail caterpillar is dependent on fennel and some other host plants. This photo is a gulf fritillary butterfly egg on passion vine. So the butterfly lays its egg on the host plant. When the egg hatches, the caterpillar eats that plant. So you can provide host plants as well as nectar plants and you'll give them a head, a head start. Obviously, they also need water. Now this little fountain in my backyard is real popular with lots of winged creatures, the birds, bees, butterflies like it, uh, lizards. So fountains, bird baths, ponds are really good water sources, but I, and you just need to keep them clean and filled for the wildlife. But I also want you to think about mud puddles. Butterflies are dependent upon uh, mud puddle type things for their puddling, which means they get their minerals as well as moisture from the puddles. So just if you have a little spot you can keep moist with uh, mud or sand or clay, possibly even some little gravel, keep it uh, moist and shallow, that will be real helpful to the butterflies. Insects need shelter as well, food, water, and shelter, just like we do. A lot of insects like to a, a low growing ground cover. It could be a natural plant ground cover. It could be leaves that have fallen under your shrubs or something or mulch. So don't be too quick to clean up the leaves that fall under your plants. Um, we all like to tidy up, but the leaf litter that falls a layer of that can be really helpful to insects. So that's one form of shelter. Another form might be a uh, pile of sticks. It might be a wooded area near your home. It might be some man-made things like a bee box or a bat box, or it could even be something like your firewood pile where I found this little guy sheltering in my yard. Okay, I'm going to suggest that you choose native plants when you're making plant selections anytime you possibly can, the things that are native to your area. It, for one thing, it's gonna be easier for you to grow. If they're native to your area, then they'll grow better there. But it will also be better for the wildlife that is accustomed to those kinds of plants in the area. I'm gonna show you a couple of things here in, in my part of Texas. This is a Mexican plum tree. And we have here a vine, this is dewberry. And we have here Turk's cap, which is kind of a shrubby perennial that the hummingbirds and butterflies love. The point is there are native plants in every category, grasses, vines, trees, shrubs, perennials. So get, you can find native lists of native plants for your area and choose those whenever possible. And it again, will be easier for you to grow and healthier for the 
wildlife as well. I am not going to give you a specific list of plants. You might have come here hoping I would, but what grows in my area won't grow in South Carolina or Brazil or somewhere else. So I am going to talk to you about the types of plants to choose. And then I will have some resources where you can find plants that plant lists for your area specifically. So if you can stay with me, I'll have some of those uh, resources for you. So this is, uh, I will admit to you, this is not a native plant, but I've had it a long time and it is not invasive. But the point is it is a tubular plant, colorful and tubular. A lot of uh, butterflies and hummingbirds love it. And this one's called firebush actually. I think I probably lost it during this re recent freeze probably will not come back. So I'll have to plant a native in its place, but colorful and tubular is one good type of plant. Here's another example of a colorful tubular plant. This is a salvia. There are zillions of kinds of salvias and there's bound to be one that grows in your area. So um, again, tubular sort of a bell shape flower is really helpful to the insects. This is fennel, a fly on fennel. Um, if you grow vegetables and herbs, usually by the time they, what we call bolt or go to flower and then seed, they're no longer as palatable to humans, but that's when the insects really love them. So they would, are really happy with herb and vegetable flowers. And in our part of the country, those, those kinds of, of vegetables and flowers usually flower in the winter in the colder months and there's not as much blooming then so it's really helpful to them so things like broccoli um, dill parsley arugula lettuces all sorts of things will go to flower if you let them so consider those and this type flower is also like a little cluster flower so there are a lot of nectar sources in one place for them which is helpful the daisy style flower is a great source of nectar and pollen. This is Gallardia, but uh, it can be a daisy or a coneflower, zinnias, all sorts of things. It has that nice flat center that's just full of nectar. So the butterfly or bee or whatever can land on the center of that flower and just get all sorts of nectar in one place without having to move around. So any of the daisy style flowers are really good for them. And this is Texas thistle, which isn't the daisy style, but it does have a lot of those little nectar points in the center so that they can, again, land once and get lots of nectar and not use a lot of energy. So those are some really good uh, types of flowers that you can find for your area. I mentioned resources and the first one that comes to mind for our part of the world is the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center in Austin, Texas. They do research on native plants and they do cover all the different states and the Canadian provinces. So you can find them at wildflower.org. You may want to screen shoot this page so you'll have that site to look up because you can look up your state or your Canadian province and then you can find all these wonderful lists. For example, we have milkweed species here, which is again, milkweed is really important for the monarchs. They've lost their habitat. Uh, the milkweed habitat has been lost. So milkweed sources are a good thing to plant. Here we have hummingbird plants and even container gardens. So for those of you who might have a tiny yard or a patio or even a balcony, you don't have a good excuse. There are container plants that benefit insects too. So regardless of the size of your garden, there are lists for you. So you can find a source like this and get specific lists for your area of plants that will grow well. Another good source is pollinator.org. I love this one. Um, if you were to Google something like plants insects like, you're not likely to find a very good list. But if you Google pollinator plants, you'll just come up with all sorts of resources. And this is one of my favorites. It's very user-friendly. Again, it's native plants, 
and they cover all the United States and Canada. So you can put in your area and then it gives you lists like this, annual flowers, perennials, shrubs, and it lists the name of the plant, of course, the color of the flower, the size, and when it blooms, you definitely want to try to have blooms throughout the year so that you can keep the pollinators happy all year and other insects. Um, anything that attracts a pollinator will attract other insects too. So that's why pollinator plant lists are good. These lists also tell which kinds of pollinators visit it. And, and with apologies to the seasoned gardeners in the group, I've got to mention soil. You really need to understand your soil type because you may have uh, rocky soil or sandy or clay. You'll have either alkaline soil or acid. And an acid loving plant is not going to do well in alkaline soil. So it, you'll just have much better luck with your plants and the health of them if you choose plants that are specific to your type of soil. So again, apologies for something that's so elementary, but it's very important. Also be sure and put plants that have similar requirements together. So for example, a plant that needs a lot of water, don't plant it right next to something that will drown if it gets too much water. So I know, again, that sounds elementary, but be sure and uh, consider that they're just really important. And once you have made these plant selections of all the different types and created a real healthy habitat for your insects, you just never know what might show up. So I'll let Mika now tell you how to um, photograph those and I will stop my screen sharing if I can figure this one out and move on to Mika. Thanks, thank you, Barbara. Tell us how you got started. What, you know, when what would you decide? Yeah. Yeah, I was always interested in photography. Actually, my father made his career out of researching the history of photography. So it was always sort of part of our family life. I didn't um, get a degree in college in photography, but I sustained my interest. And after college, I took classes. Then my husband and I, shortly after we married, we moved to Southeast Asia. Um, and I found work there as a freelance photographer. I did a lot of um, editorial photography for magazines, uh, some travel photography also. And then when we had kids, I sort of put aside the professional camera, um, but it's always been a part of my life. I love the creative outlet. And now we live in Austin, Texas. The, the kids are grown up and I've regained my interest in it. Um, and in fact, I was starting, I was thinking of starting a pet photography business and then a year ago, I uh, discovered macro um, insect uh, photography and I'm enjoying it so much. I'm having a hard time photographing anything else. <laughs> well, well, you know, you do it very well. And I don't know if it was a conversation you and I had or something I maybe I read on your website, but I found it really, the statement was basically you see faces in insects, like they have their own little personalities. Yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about how my journey into this type of photography, and I'll be covering some of that because, yes, it's completely changed my whole outlook. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's exciting for me. So. I hope you'll think so too. But. Oh, I, I, I already do. <laughs> I've gotten a little sneak peek, everybody. So um, I think you're in for a treat. Okay, with that, Mika, I'm gonna let you have the camera. Yeah, so uh, tonight, Linda asked me to share uh, my experiences with photographing macro and close-up photography of insects and other tiny critters that I've really been concentrating on uh, the last year. Uh, and I'll, I'll cover tonight, um, I'll share my experience of how I came across this concentration of photography. And I'll show you my garden, um, as well as go over the equipment that I use, uh, my sort of go-to camera settings to get the, the style of photography that I like, and uh, tips on where to find these little creatures, as well as some techniques you can use to sort of increase your chances 
of getting uh, photos of them. And then I'll talk about uh, how to go about, uh, how I go about uh, finding a background and different angles to uh, make your subject uh, stand out. So two years ago, I actually, I pulled, I was a lifelong Nikon user and I sold all of my Nikon equipment, the DSLR, the lenses, and I purchased a Sony full frame mirrorless camera along with two lenses. Uh, one of the lenses was a macro lens. A macro is something I've always wanted to really give a try because I've seen so many inspiring macro uh, photos. But to be honest, the, you know, I experimented with the macro lens and I found the focusing tricky and it ended up being the lens that I just kept in my bag or at home. And then a year ago, um, during the pandemic isolation, I started hiking. These are our two dogs. They're each about 100 pounds, uh, Casper and Cinco. And I spent hours uh, on remote nature trails with them and started really um, just loving what I discovered in nature. And I thought it would be perfect opportunity to uh, photograph what I was seeing and finally, finally make use of that macro lens. Uh, so I made some rules. I like setting challenges for myself. I could only take my macro lens with me. I had to have it out the whole time and I had to come back with photos. So at first I started uh, photographing little stationary objects I found, like the beautiful wildflowers. And as my technical ab abilities improved, I discovered that tiny wildflower buds that were just large enough to hold a single raindrop were also just the right size to hold a Katie did, as expressive as a musical note. I was amazed with the things I found. I discovered a princess with braids and a cape, a comical jester with striped leggings, a cowboy with big boots riding a wild thistle, and a Spider-Man wasp. What were these creatures? I went home, I did a lot of research, Googling, and I discovered that the Spider-Man is actually a spider woman. Uh, she's a tarantula hawk wasp who specializes in hunting tarantulas for her young. And the cowboy is a leaf-footed bug who uses its large hind legs to fight other males back to back over females and territories. Their stories became as important to me as, um, as the photos themselves. And now I can never look at an insect again and think, oh, that's just a bug. Um, I really want to know a bit about its life. I grab my lens. I want to see what its face looks like and uh, really learn about them. So I've been concentrating on them in the last year and I'm really, I'm just having the time of my life. I think I've never enjoyed um, an area of photography as much. So I wanted to show you a little bit of my garden. Um, not exactly what the type of garden that Barbara <laughs> described. Uh, it's a dairy scape. We were doing low maintenance ones. And in fact, when uh, Linda asked me to you know, do a presentation tonight, I was thinking, oh my goodness, the majority of my photos I do outside of my garden. How am I gonna find enough photos? And I went through um, what I've taken in just the past year in my garden. And I was pretty blown away by the diversity that I have found there. These are just some of the creatures that I have photographed in my garden this last year. Um, I lost quite a few of the, the plants from the lasses everybody here did with that uh, last storm in Texas. And I'm looking forward to taking some of Barbara's tips and uh, creating a safe space for insects and uh, having more of an opportunity to photograph at home. So I will, I'll share um, the equipment that I use. Um, I know everybody has different systems, so I don't wanna spend too much time on it, uh, but I will tell you what I use. I use a Sony 7R3, a mirrorless um, full frame camera, which I really like. I have a dedicated macro lens, the Sony 90 millimeter 2.8. Um, it's super sharp. 
And I like that I can switch from manual to autofocus easily just by moving the barrel of the lens. Uh, and if you don't have a dedicated macro lens, there are so many options that you have. Uh, lots of good videos out there using extension tubes or reversing your lens. Um, you can also use a uh, uh, filter on a uh, non-macro lens and get macro effects. In fact, there's one that I use, the NEC 77 millimeter close-up lens kit. Um, and it's great to get that macro effect on a regular lens. And I use it on my macro lens uh, to get even greater details. I learned about this from a happiness hour from Jose Madrigal. He gave a great presentation. I've learned so much from him, I still do. Um, and it's a really good option. Now, when I first started macro photography, I actually didn't have a flash and I just went out there. I'm lucky because I do a lot of photography and uh, open uh, fields here, full sun. Uh, and I like traveling light. And if I use a high ISO, then there is a program called Topaz Denoise that I'll use uh, in editing to take out some of the noise. But that said, there are a lot of photos in macro. You're so close to your subject. Uh, your depth of field is very, very narrow. So if you want a greater depth of field and if you're photographing in dark areas, you'll really, really need a flash. And it's an important part of my equipment. And if you use the flash, you're gonna need a diffuser because you want to soften the light. You don't want hot spots. There are a lot of insects with, with shiny shells um, and you want a nice even light that comes right over your lens because your subject is very close to your lens usually. A lot of homemade options with this there, uh, that are very inexpensive and that's really fun to try, but I wanted to show you uh, the three that I use most frequently now, the two in the back are actually made by macro photographers who develop their own homemade versions and they now sell them, which I think is a really cool thing. Um, this is a Cygnus diffuser who's, uh, that is made by a photographer in Australia, Brendan James. And it's great because I can um, have it folded flat in my backpack and the laptop section. And then when I need it, it's easy to take out, assemble quickly. The diffusion material is also flexible, uh, which really comes in handy to shape the, the light over the subject. And also if you're trying to avoid a branch and you don't want to disturb the insect. Um, this is one that I've recently started using, the AK diffuser, extremely well made, solidly built. Um, it's, and it's made by Camere in uh, Florida in the, the US. Uh, very nice even lighting and you can actually put uh, LED on top of it if you're doing night photography, which I haven't done and will help uh, the camera focus. Um, it's not easy to quickly disassemble and assemble, but if I'm going on a dedicated macro photography trip uh, or I'm at home, this is you know the one I'll grab a lot. Uh, this was the first diffuser I ever purchased. It's the Angler diffuser. It's less than $10 on Amazon. You can see it's not as elaborate, but it folds to a very small size and it doubles as a sun diffuser, which really can come in handy. And I'll, let's talk a little bit about the camera techniques that I use with this type of photography. I use the flexible spot. It's also called the variable spot um, so that I can tell the camera where I want it to focus, whether rather than the camera deciding. Uh, with handheld, I always use continuous high. That way, if I press the shutter, it will um, release a, a burst. You get a burst of photos, which increases the chances of getting one in focus. Um, programmable buttons, um, if you have them on your camera, they can really come in handy. I have one programmable button uh, with all the settings that I normally use for handheld macro, and then another button that I have programmed with all the settings, my go-to settings with flash macro. That way I can quickly switch between one or the other. Um, 
And I use a mixture of autofocus and manual focus, usually autofocus when I'm first approaching the subject, also with some larger ones like, you know, larger butterflies. But as I'm getting closer, if I'm really at that one-to-one -one, um, range, uh, I, I use manual focus uh, to pinpoint. And on my camera, there are some manual focus assist features, which might be worth looking into. Um, if you have them available. Uh, these might be available too on DSLRs uh, that have live view. Uh, one that I use is the Peak Assist. The camera displays a color and it will show you visually right where you have the focus so you can make adjustments if you need to. And then the other thing that I use uh, quite a bit is focus magnification. So I'm learning, I can zoom on an area uh, to make sure that I'm getting it in focus. And I'll also share with you quickly, you know, the basic, these are the initial flash settings um, I use. Uh, and, you know, if you're new to flash, you can give it a try and go where you want to go to get the results you want. I do, I usually start with one eighth of a full power. I use the flash on manual. And uh, one thing I find useful or appealing, I like the way uh, the color looks if I have the camera set to daylight color setting. And when I'm shooting handheld, these are basically the settings I start with um, and make adjustments uh, based on uh, what I'm shooting. If I want a greater depth of field or if the subject, if it's an insect that is moving quickly, you know, of course I'll use a, a faster shutter speed. ISO, I usually, sometimes I'll put a max, but I'm really flexible with the ISO because I use that program that I mentioned before, uh, sometimes to Topaz denoise in editing. And before, now we're getting, you know, to hopefully the more fun point with uh, uh, looking at some photos. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about my approach and my philosophy the majority of the photos I take um, of insects and little critters, it's in their natural setting. And I try not to disturb them as I photograph them. I'm very cognizant of the fact that the world, their world is a fragile one. Um, the only time I take photos outside of their natural environment in my home is if I find them in my house or I brought them in to rescue them. And I would never do anything to an insect to slow it down just to take its photo. That's just my approach. And I feel very strongly about that too. So now let's talk about um, in general areas to uh, find some of these little creatures. Of course, in your home, um, let's say you're in an apartment or you don't have a nice garden like with me, I would go out when I was out. I would look if there was a neighbor with a pretty garden, I would talk to them and say, hey, you've got such a nice garden. Do you mind if I come by sometimes? You know, just in your front yard and take photos. It's actually been a great way to meet people. And I've gotten some really nice shots taking advantage of other people's talents with plants that I absolutely do not have. Um, other places, of course, any park or schoolyard, any place, especially that has water, uh, water is a great place. It attracts a lot of insects. I spend a lot of time wading in rivers and creeks um, and exploring the banks. These are some, just some of the photos I found um, when in the water and exploring the banks. This is another one of those leaf-footed bugs, uh, candy-striped hopper. And this is a leafhopper nymph that I only had a few seconds with before it used those incredible legs and hopped off. Uh, also exploring the fields near rivers and any place you find a lot of flowers, you usually can find a lot of dragonflies and damselflies and wasps. If you don't have a lot of um, trails and nature uh, places to explore, you can also um, see if you have a community garden and talk to them to see if you can go by and take photos. Or even a nursery is a good place to look. And of course, uh, botanical gardens. Um, I've spent quite a few outings at uh, Zilker Botanical Gardens here in Austin taking photos. 
and that near our couple, that's a little hover fly there. And best time to search, to go out and photograph insects. Uh, morning is a great time. Uh, they're not as active and sometimes they'll have dew on them, which is really a beautiful thing to see early evening. I've also had a lot of luck, especially on the rivers um, with damselflies and dragonflies. But that said, the majority of the photos I've taken are in between these times. Really, just get out there anytime and see what you can find. Make the most of the situation. Um, I always have my camera with me if I'm out in nature. It doesn't matter what time it is. And just explore and have fun with it. Weather can make a difference. Uh, if it's uh, windy, I wouldn't make a uh, you know, drive a long distance to go on a macro photography trip. But if I'm out, I'll have my camera with me and I'll look for uh, sturdier uh, objects that won't be affected by the wind. Uh, for instance, this is a snout nose um, butterfly that I found on a trunk of a, um, of a ash juniper. Uh, also, we have a lot of cactus here that aren't affected by the wind. So I'll always look at, you know, prickly pears if it's, if it's uh, windy. You can also look at rocks and moss, anything that won't be blown by the wind. And if it's raining, oh my goodness, just after the rain, get out there. That's when the insects are coming out from hiding. And it's just, I find, a magical world. Um, getting those drops around the insect, on the insects. This is a green fly in our garden. Um, and this is a, uh, a damsel fly I found along a river who was hiding out just after the rain. So some, some tips uh, for uh, shooting the insects. One, I rarely stay at eye level. I am on my knees a lot, I'm on my tiptoes. I really, I like to find a place that I think has potential and really spend my time exploring it. This uh, beautiful golden digger wasp, um, who is a pollinator too. She also kills, um, hunts caterpillars for her, for her babies. But uh, I spent some time photographing her. She was on top of the flowers, as you can see. But when she got tired of me, she flew away. And I explored a little bit more and just lower, I found this really interesting looking web worm, web worm moth that looks sort of like a beetle when it's stationary with the wings completely closed. And when it uh, flies, it looks like a wasp. Uh, under leaves, always look under leaves. Insects like to hide there. This is a lynx spider I found hiding underneath um, a sage leaf and I kept checking, this is at home, so you have the luxury of just checking whenever you're out there to see what's happening. And it finally came out on top of the leaf. Um, low down in the grass, I noticed uh, a lot of wasp activity. Uh, and so I sort of twirled around and uh, I love just ex you know watching, observing these insects working and I believe these were uh, chewing up plant matter and make it into a pulp so that they could build the wasp that sort of looked like a, a paper material. Also always look in, in the center of flowers. This is one that, you know, Barbara mentioned is the flat, I guess, daisy type. And there's always a lot of activity, whether it's frolicking or if it's collecting nectar. Um, and if you notice leaves that are leaves or petals that are um, uh, chewed, I always go to see if I can see who is dining and maybe get some shots. And this took me a long time. It took me a while to realize just how small things you should be looking for. You get wonderful butterflies and bees. There are a lot of bigger things, but then if you have a macro lens, you can really go small. I took this just the other day. I went out to you know, take a shot for the presentation to kind of show you um, just how tiny these are. And I don't know if you can see, can you see my mouse? And I'm uh, yes, yes. Okay. So right there, it's a little crab spider, and that is my pinky right next to it, uh, which is just amazing. And here I was able to get closer and get another shot. Um, and you can see, too, how well the crab spider blends in. They sort of change their colors to 
blend into the flowers, which is, is pretty amazing. Um, and then some of the things are so small, I don't even see them when I'm looking through my lens. Sometimes it's only in editing that I'll, I'll see a, a tiny surprise. This is a photo I had slated for deleting. Um, you can see the eyes not in focus, uh, but I've learned actually not to delete too quickly because there are some wonderful surprises. And if you can see on the wasp um, mouth, there is a little insect there. And no, I am not going to do anything with this photo, but I just, I just love discovering these things in nature. And so much of this I just do for my own enjoyment. Here's another one that I wanted to share with you that I discovered, my eyes just didn't notice, I discovered um, when I was editing the photos and I had this one slated for deletion too. Uh, I spent a lot of time photographing this bee, got a lot of beautiful photos of it. And this one, I don't, do you notice the odd looking um, stem right there? I actually cloned it out of one of the photos but here you can see she or he is using it to climb up onto the petal. And it turns out it's not a stem at all. It's a little inchworm. Um, I have a series of like 10 photos uh, with the bee and the inchworm. So I get a kick out of that stuff. I find I take the best photos when I can sort of relax and I leave behind the outside world and I pay attention to what's around me. Um, it's good to use more than just your eyes. I now use my ears quite a bit. And <clears throat> excuse me, in fact, um, you know, sometimes I don't hear a sound and I'll be like, oh, that's a grasshopper. And I'll look and see if it lands right by me. Uh, this is a really interesting one I found uh, just a couple of weeks ago I hadn't seen before. Um, I, I think it's a cattail toothpick grasshopper, but I'm still researching it. Uh, when I was out with my dogs hiking early on, I kept on hearing a high pitch buzzing sound and I knew it wasn't the typical bee sound. And I would go closer to the noise, but whenever I did, it would stop and I could not see a thing. And then it would start again. And I still didn't see anything. So I just held my camera out and took photos in the direction of the noise, trying to get as close as possible. Then when I got home, I would look at the photo um, on my large screen and it became, I don't know if you know the, those books, the Where is Waldo, but it became a Where is Waldo game for me. And I would try to uh, discover what was uh, making that noise. And in this photo, you can see very out of focus. I'm showing you tonight oh, so many photos that I take are out of focus. Sometimes you only have one chance, um, but for you know one that one photo that ends up really nice, I have tons more that were out of focus. So anyway, then I knew what the insect looked like. It's a bee fly. And so when I was going out on outings in the future, I would hear that noise and I would think, oh, tiny, tiny little brown flying object. And it helped me locate them. Uh, this is one shot I got of the bee fly not long after that. And then at Zilfer Botanical Gardens, I came across them again. I think this one is a different species. Um, and it's also good to just keep in mind that insects, they either stand out to warn other insects um, off or they are really good at being camouflaged so they're not seen. Here is a, uh, another leaf-footed bug. Apparently I have a lot of those around. <laughs> and this is a bee assassin bug. I'm sure uh, a lot of people aren't going to like this one, but I like photographing all insects. And uh, they actually have a sticky uh, legs that helps them grab um, an insect and it's blending in really well. A uh, flower beetle, same color. On this little wildflower, there's a, I think it might be another crab spider. Um, it never came out, but it's very well camouflaged. 
even with larger uh, things, they can be re really well hidden. Uh, these are the roots of our live oak, and I noticed something a little different there. And when I came closer, it moved because they told that it was hiding out. I also watch where they land. Sometimes I have success with that. Uh, not long ago, I noticed a lot of, they looked like dandelion tufts that were floating around, but then they had more purpose and they were landing in the grass and then taking off. So I ran inside the house. I got my camera, the Nisi lens, flash diffuser and got out there. And I just started crawling all over the place. Um, and I finally was able to uh, photograph and this just astounded me. It, the non-biting midge, and just look at those antenna, the furry antenna, the males have those so that it can detect uh, females. And they only live for a couple of days. Uh, they only mate, they don't even eat. Um, another one that I was able to photograph by watching where it landed, this little, well, these two damselflies that were mating. Um, no bigger, you can see how large they are. It's, you know, they're just sort of the same width as a blade of grass. Uh, also, another thing that I find comes in handy for uh, finding insects is to notice what plants they like, not just in your garden, but when you're out and about on trails. Um, I came across this button bush bloom and I noticed it had a great amount of activity on it. And you can see there are at least three uh, bees, two moths, and a number of tiny little flies. So then whenever I'm on any trail, if I see a button bush on the other side, I'll go check it out. And it became sort of a neat project for me to see what I would find. Um, learning about subjects, I mean, for me, as you probably, um, already surmised that's a big part of me. I love uh, finding out more information. I don't think I know a single scientific name, um, just they sort of go in one ear out the other. What I like learning about is, you know, how they live and what they eat and things like that that are more practical. And they can also, you know, knowing more about your subjects can really help you find them too. For instance, this pretty uh, butterfly they're only about an inch big. It's a, they're called juniper hair streaks and they're called junipers because they spend a lot of their lives in junipers, which are also called, I think, mountain uh, cedar here. You know, the ones that are uh, <laughs> responsible for so many people's misery during allergy season. But the males, they'll, they'll stay, you'll see a big group of them in junipers just waiting uh, for females to come along so that they can mate and the females lay their eggs on the ends of the branches and um, they blend. This one really stands out on the yellow flower, but they blend in really well against the uh, mountain cedar. Another thing when I was, you know, I saw so many incredible uh, photographs on the Instagram of spiders. So I wanted to go find some. And at first I would go out and I would look for webs because if you see a web, you'll see a spider. And I started reading more uh, about spiders and discovered there are a lot of spiders that really don't use a web at all. Um, ambush spiders, this is a jumping spider. I find them so adorable. And they actually do have quite a bit of personality and they're smart too. And they tend to um, stay out in the open, you know, in the sun, um, waiting for uh, the prey to come along. This is when I took early on, uh, when I started this type of photography, it was on a patio chair, a green lynx spider that's on a little bud. Um, also, this is something else I, I think I learned from Jose Magical too during that presentation with dragonflies and damselflies, they're quite territorial. Um, so if they fly away from the perch, wait at the perch and chances are they'll come back. And that has been a wonderful, wonderful tip for me. Okay, improving your chances for a great photo. As I said, so many of my photos are out of focus and it's up to the bug. You don't have control over the whole situation. 
Uh, you can see here, I think this is another actually tarantula hawk wasp. The grass in front of it is in focus. Uh, the wasp is out of focus. I didn't get another chance. And there are some things that I have found that sort of improve my chances of getting more than one photo of, um, of an insect. Um, I set up my camera with the settings before I even start shooting. Like when I'm in a certain location, I look at the lights and you know adjust the camera accordingly. And when I see something, I take a shot right away. Um, if that's my only chance, even if it's out of focus, I wanna see what that little bug was. And then I slowly take a step, click, slowly take a step and approach it as I am shooting. I also observe how the insect is reacting to me. Um, if it flees or sort of flies at you, react strongly, just let it go. You know, it, it can also help you from getting stung. And if it's really scared of you, just move on and find somebody else who's more into your presence to photograph. If it's indifferent, you know, maybe it's uh, collecting nectar, it notices you, but it keeps, you know, darting from flower to flower. Uh, then what I do is I focus on what it is focusing on. Uh, for instance, this is one of the few photos not taken in Austin in this series. Um, this was at the Denver Botanical Gardens. There were these beautiful flowers. I don't know what they are, but I'm sure <laughs> Barbara would. Uh, and I was chasing bees around for a long time, trying to get it. And eventually I just stayed put near uh, a flower. I focused on the flower and I just waited. And eventually it didn't take long a uh, bee. Uh, came to the flower. Here's another one. This is uh, a beautiful green uh, sweat bee. And there were only a few blooms on this plant. And the sweat bee was going from one to another. And I just focused, picked one, focused, you know, and then once the sweat bee came, I made adjustments to get the shot. They're really good pollinators too, by the way. The sweat bees are Instead, if you come across an insect that just freezes when you see it, when it sees you, what I do is I freeze my movement completely. I just stop and let it get used to my presence and then um, proceed slowly as I shoot. This is a grasshopper that I noticed who was chewing a, a leaf and I stuck with it for a while. It got used to me. It was chewing bigger uh, bigger holes and kept peeking out at me. Here's another one, longhorn beetle. Again, this is for a shot, not a great one. And uh, it saw me and it went further up the blade of grass and hid there, which I kind of like these shots. Um, and then it eventually peeked out to get a look at me to see if I was still there. <laughs> and then I moved on. Um, this was a really, I was hiking with the dogs and there were these beautiful yellow flowers and I noticed a quite large face. Now, remember this is me saying quite large, you know, it was probably, I don't know, an inch big peeking out at me. I got closer and it would duck further away. And this went on for a little while. Uh, eventually I gave up, um, I went off with the dogs and I kept thinking, oh, I wonder what that insect was. So I decided to go back and just have a look. And when I went back, it was out on top of the flowers and it looked at me and sort of like, oh, it's just her, uh, you know, she isn't a threat. I know they probably don't think that at all, but um, it's a real assassin bug. Um, and uh, it stuck around, it seemed to not mind me and I was able to get a variety of shots and angles. Okay, so we'll move on to, to background now. Um, with macro photography, or you're, you're close to the subject. Uh, backgrounds tend to sort of be out of focus, but I use, you know, my style, I do not just one-to-one -one reproduction macro. A lot of times I like to show a bit of the habitat as well. Um, background, depending on what you're what you choose, it can really make uh, the insect stand out as well. Um, so I'll just go through, I thought I'd show you some examples of uh, how I aim to get the background I want in a particular photo. 
Um, but naturally, this is one, this is my yard. This is the first shot of a dragonfly who was spending a lot of time on the yucca flower. We don't have a lot of flowers around, so it doesn't, you know, there aren't a lot of choices, but it kept uh, coming back to the yucca plant. I definitely didn't want the fence as the background. It blends in with the color um, of the dragonfly. So at first I thought I'd try to get a bit of the buds that were behind uh, the dragonfly. And I'm moving closer as I'm doing this shooting all the time. I think the dragonfly flew off a couple times, but came back. So I get a little bit closer, change my angle to get more of the pink behind it. And that one I, I really ended up liking. I love the, the smile on its face too. And then we have a, um, a iris plant, potted plant to the right. So I decided to try and incorporate that. And I really like that too, but the expression on the face, not as much, but um, the background I do really like. Uh, here's another one. This was a grasshopper I came across in uh, a field and you can see there are a couple of wildflowers. Grasshoppers tend to either like jump away right away or just stay still. And this one, I was very fortunate and decided to let me stick around. Um, I did a side portrait at first. The background really doesn't do anything. So I decided to see if I could change my angle and get that wildflower behind it. And I really like that with the contrast to the green. Uh, this was another time, again, I was hiking with the dogs. It's not like I recommend taking your dogs to, <laughs> to do macro shots. I've lost a lot of opportunities when I have them with me, but I make the most of, you know, whenever I'm out in nature, I saw this uh, leaf-footed bug, a big one up on uh, very tall grass. So right away, I knew I wanted a shot from below. So I lay down on my back. Dogs came over and lay down with me wondering what the heck I was doing. And I got the shot on the left with the, the sky above it, you know, sort of nearly a silhouette, which I enjoyed. And then I got on my knees and changed my angle to, to get some of uh, the trees in the background too. Um, with flash, the background's a little bit different. If the, the light from the flash, if there's nothing for it to reflect off of, you'll get a black background. If it has, you know, like a leaf or a flower close enough so it reflects the light from the flash, reflects off of that, you'll get some of that color. Um, here's an example. I was out, this is my first shot again. I noticed this little plant and uh, a tiny, I think it was a furrow bee. Um, and I was sort of here, I'm um, seeing if my flash is the right power, what changes I should make. And I decided to first uh, go for a, a background that maybe is more dramatic. So this is the black one. I don't always like this, but I, I kind of like it in, in this um, case. It sort of really uh, brings out the, the subject, makes, and even though it doesn't look completely natural. And then for the second shot, I aim from above and actually with one hand was able to move some of the lower leaves a little bit closer and took some shots. Now these, believe me, believe me, these aren't the only shots I took. I took so many photos in order to get a few that I really liked. So just be gentle with yourself. Like don't be critical, take lots of shots even if they're not in focus and just look at them later and learn from them. And this is to show you, this isn't the same uh, exact plant, but it's the same type of plant. And again, that's my pinky there. Uh, it's just mind blowing to me how much the camera, the lens can see. Uh, this, my husband actually pulled me and said, Mika, there's a dragonfly in her bedroom. And I went to explore and we saw, nope, it's not a dragonfly. It's a uh, robber fly, also called an assassin fly. And it was on the windowsill. This is the first shot that I took. Uh, green background doesn't really go much. There wasn't anything, any other choice because it's just what was outside the window. But I went and I got, uh, and that was without flash, by the way. So I went, I got the Nisi filter to put on my macro lens, uh, the flash, the diffuser, and I got this shot, which I quite like. It's dramatic with the black and the white and uh, sort of brings out the red of the robber fly. 
Here's another one from inside. I rescued this uh, crane fly. It was in the dog's um, water container and I scooped it out with a, a UPS cardboard brochure and brought it into a bedroom on the windowsill where I just let it uh, recover. Um, and this was with the Nisi lens too and a flash, but you can see no nice background there. I came back later to check on it and I was pretty surprised to see it was there sort of stretching out, uh, drying itself, I guess, get a feeling for its environment. Um, I had, uh, I got a sort of purplish blouse that I had nearby and put that against the edge of the window and I got this shot. Then I moved in closer so you don't see the edges of the cardboard um, and got this one, not your typical Mika photo, but I had a lot of fun with this and I like the contrast of the eyes against the background. Now in your garden, I just want to quickly say your garden, like one of the wonderful things is you can treat the garden like a studio in a lot of ways. And um, you can move potted plants behind other plants in order to get the background that you want. I also um, use fabric. Well, in this case, this is the yucca plant again, the only flower one, flowering one we had um, at the time. And it was getting a lot of activity, you know, in, in, uh, in those days. And the gray fence uh, I knew wasn't really going to get me the effect that I wanted. So I picked a pink shirt that I had and took it outside, hung it on a, you know, one of those sort of drying racks. And I was able to get uh, a photo that I found more appealing. And with angle and composition, those are um, other things that can really come in handy and uh, make your uh, photo a little unique. You know, it'd be so nice if you could ask the insect to, you know, give you an antenna flip or to, you know, work that wing, but you can't. And if they give you the opportunity to take more than one photo, then what I really do is I try to work the room. I try to get as many angles as I can. Uh, for instance, here's that one I said, the princess with the braid, she's a leaf roller moth. And um, I got the, the shot from above, but then I also, I love that profile with the, it's nearly a, a duck face that she has. Uh, here's another one, a butterfly, same butterfly, same stick, two very different photos. It, the angles also can really help with IDs later uh, when you're trying to find out what the insects are. Uh, dragonflies, I really like the head-on photos. It's really neat to, to see those incredible eyes up close. And then from the side, it's really, it's, it's a very different um, photo. This is another robber fly. The robber fly was the one that was in our bedroom. And I find them actually, in general, quite easy subjects. They're larger for one. Also, they tend to stay still. Uh, I probably have about 10 different angles of this one. Uh, they're incredible. Um, they're pros at what they do, by the way. They can catch insects mid-flight. See those claws? Uh, and they catch them, they fly back with them, they inject them with uh, some uh, poison to uh, keep them still and then they take them back and they eat them. But it was kind of neat seeing what it looks like from above because I haven't had that chance before. And dragon, uh, the damsel flies, I, I tend to like the, the head on look too. But that's really, um, really the end of the presentation, I just, wanted to say to really give yourself freedom to explore, use your own vision to get the photos that you like to get, uh, do it for yourself. Um, you know, at first I think I was always so caught up with, you know, getting that eye in focus and comparing myself to others. And I still do that sometimes. There's great inspiration out there as well, but there's a fine line I think between inspiration and self-criticism. But anyway, this is a fly. I like taking things from their perspective sometimes. And to me, it's sort of like he's looking out at his 
kingdom. This one, it was all about the petals and the flowers and just the pretty soft scene. Um, I like the way he just looks like he's so happy to see that thistle and he's just giving it a hug. I also like focusing on just one part of insects. I'm pretty obsessed with, with wings and find them fascinating. So sometimes I try not to get the whole insect in there. Um, feet are another thing I'm pretty obsessed with. And this is one of the, I guess, the type of tubular uh, flowers that Barbara mentioned. Um, and I love the way the, the bees feet sort of mimic the, uh, the way the stamen look as well. And this one, I just love the way the bee is crawling in there and uh, curling the petal to get as far in as possible. So that's it. That was wonderful. Thank you. You did great. Okay, so I'm gonna get you to stop sharing your screen. Okay. And I'm going to put some questions in front of you and Barbara. So Barbara, if you don't mind, go ahead and come back on video and um, unmute yourself. There you go. So, there, so guys, if you have any questions, this is a good time to stick it in the chat and I'll try to catch them. Um, so Barbara, Michelle wanted to know, um, how do you find a master gardener in, in her area? They're all over Texas in most counties, unless there's some really, really tiny ones. And it's, uh, let me see what that website is. I looked it up, uh, mastergardener.tamu.edu. Okay. And that is a, a public site that will tell you what the Master Gardener program is. And you can click on um, the counties and it will tell you about your county. But it's basically, you can, you usually, we're affiliated with the county extension offices. So if you can find your local county extension office, they can also connect you with your own Master Gardener program if you have one, or if not, maybe the neighboring county. Um, so, well, I've got you, Barbara. Uh, Jamie had a question. She wanted to know, how do you find out what type of soil you have? Again, the county extension office is really helpful with that. They will likely know because they help the farmers and all that. So they typically know, usually your soil is going to be very similar to what else is going on in your county. So if you want to kind of know what type soil your county has, like in Michelle's case, she's in East Texas. So it's very likely sandy and acid, but not always. Like in Waco, where I live, some of the soil is in the east part is sandy and acid. So, um, and the other is alkaline. The a more specific way to find out is again at your county extension office. They have these um, soil sample kits, and it's a little bag, and you take literally take soil samples of your garden area and put it in this bag and mail it to Texas A and M with fifteen dollars, and they give you a complete soil sample evaluation and it tells what kind of fertilizer you need to use and all sorts of things. So those are two ways, but both you would start with the extension service. All right. That, that's a great resource. Thank you for looking those up and, and being able to spew those out. Um, so there's, we're going to move to some camera photography questions for Mika. Um, Mika, Karen wanted to know how close are you usually when you are photographing these insects? It really depends. I do, I don't stick to, a lot of macro photographers, they only do it one-to-one -one, uh, reproduction. With me, I just go, some of mine are just close-up versus macro, and I just uh, do what looks best to me. If I'm doing it at pure macro, I'm close. I mean, the minimum working distance from the end of the lens, I think it's about five and a half inches. Um, so when I can get close, I, I do get close, but sometimes I like to have more of the habitat included in it too. Okay. And, um, Jamie was wondering, how do you, this is a great question, Jamie. Um, how do you manage to manually focus with fast moving bugs? It is so, so hard. I mean, that is one of the, the biggest challenges that, that I have, um, and it's really, it's a lot of, of practice. I do a lot of practice in sort of more controlled environments and a lot of planning where um, I try to pre-plan where the bug might go and focus there. There's, for me, it's something I'm still trying to improve, um, but fast shutter speed taking lots and lots and lots of photos and sort of trying to guess what's gonna happen next. 
Okay. Um, so this is a question from Gary. Uh, I think Mika, do you use manual or ETTL flash? And I use manual. Okay. I use manual, and okay. you know, adjust the power accordingly. That's another good question. Uh, Ajitia is wondering, uh, what kind of sources are you using, or what's your go-to source to identify some of these insects that you're photographing? Oh, I like that question. I, you know, I do a lot of Google, of course. My first, the first starting point that I use is um, iNaturalist, yep. and I'll look up and see what looked suggestions they offer, and then I go to Google. I'll see lots of photos of that insect. And I find it useful to, for instance, not just Google, um, you know, longhorn, you know, a particular type of insect, also put the area that you found it into and see what photos you find of insects around there. I've also, you know, I, I have some books too that I've found useful. There's uh, one on dragonflies in our area in the state, one on um, damselflies. Another great one that I have about bees in North America that I'm starting to uh, read and it's great uh, research material too. Okay, so I didn't see any other questions and if I missed them, I have to apologize. You guys, Barbara and Mika, you guys generated a lot of comments, Aww. a lot of comments. My, my screen was jumping here. So if I missed a question, I really apologize. But at the end of this, I'm going to give you their contact information again so that you can reach out to them if I messed up on my end. Um, one of the, when you were sh introducing some of the insects at the very beginning, you kind of had like the Superman and, and you had these little names that you've created for them. And I'm sitting there going, it does look like a, you know, Superman or Spider-Man. I can't remember which one it was, but um, Lynn's, uh, Lynn also said she, she loved the descriptions of all the insects. They were so creative and, and you really did kind of, you kind of gave them a little personality and, and, you know, um, um, yeah, I, write, like, even, I write stories in my head sometimes about these insects as I'm photographing. Yeah. I just, yeah. I have a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, that was just great. And then um, Eugenia has wanted to say, your sharp focus is out of this world, Mika. And um, he was referring, well, he, was, he was also also referencing one of the images that you had uh, were shown at the time. But he says, uh, there was a bug that, I think you said something about the bad hair day. And he said, you could count the number of hair strings on it. So that's just amazing sharpness. <laughs> yeah. Um, Barbara, Thank you have to keep in mind, there are a lot of ones that aren't good that I take through. And that's all <laughs> yep, That's okay. That's okay. Uh, Barbara, uh, Ajiti wanted to tell you, thank you for sharing all these resources because he found it very helpful. You know, I'm finding it very helpful. Um, but, you know, right away, he's going to be able to implement some of the things that you said and some of the resources you gave him or gave us to put into his own small landscaping project. So this was just great timing, especially since, you know, we, we had a, a very hard winter, even though it was like just a few days, but it was very hard on our, on our gardens here in, in Texas. So, um, and to both of you, Don uh, Simpson, who is a gentleman who does presentations quite a bit, and he's, he's done one for us. I recently watched him do one for another photography club. He will be coming back soon for the happiness hour, but he said both presenters are excellent and their photography is outstanding. So please take that and, and, and just really embrace it because I know that, you know, you, you, you were a little nervous about doing this and, and yeah, I mean, it's nerve, it is nerve wracking and you guys just did such a wonderful job. So I hope that you had fun and I feel like I learned a lot more about insects than I want to know. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I am, I'm hoping that Barbara won't make me go look for my own flowers. She'll just tell me this is the list, Linda, just do that. <laughs> so guys, I'm going to, uh, is there anything you guys want to say before I, you know, kind of close out our session tonight? 
Well, I really enjoyed Mika's program too. So I was relaxed after mine and it was fun to see that. And um, I did find one, one bad bug in there, Mika. I don't like those leaf footed bugs. They suck the juices out of my tomatoes. Oh no. And I, I see so bugs. many. <laughs> I'll try to think of them as cowboys, but they are not welcome in my garden. I'll try and keep them away. I'll tell them to tell their friends. No, but thank you for, for having us. I mean, I really enjoyed Barbara's presentation too. I learned so many things and it was a very fun experience to be on the other side. I've gotten um, so much out of watching other people's presentations and I think I still enjoy doing that a little bit more. <laughs> I can have wine when I do that. Um, but yeah, no, this was a great experience and thank you everyone for, for watching us. Yeah, no, it's, you know, we, I kind of joked, but you know, there are people in this room um, that are extremely talented photographers and their creativity, you know, they're thinking I'm just posting my little picture and, I like it and maybe a few other people will like it, but there's some really amazing photographers in this room. And um, the ones that are sharing, they just get a little bit more um, bravery points, but it, you know, we shared at the beginning of the, the session, I just said, hey, um, throw in your Instagram, throw in your website, if you have a, a photography page that you want to, to share, this is a good time to do that. So those people who are watching, you know, on YouTube aren't going to be able to see that, but the people in the room, look and see who's here and take a, take a look at their websites and especially their Instagram feeds, because you're, there's inspiration every time you scroll. There's just something that's going to jump at you and go, why didn't I think about that? Or next time I see that, I'm going to kind of Think about it a little bit longer. So for that, I, I really appreciate you guys coming on and sharing the, you know, the things, you know, the knowledge that you've, you know, you've learned and, and um, you generously shared with us tonight. So with that, I'm going to close you guys out and thank you again for putting on a, a fantastic presentation. So guys, you can connect with Mika through her website at MikaGeiger.com. And if you're on Instagram, look for her at Mika.Geiger. And Barbara can be found on Instagram at Bobsy3. And I'm going to include those links in the show notes. So next week, graphic design artist and social media manager, Heather Foster will be here to talk about social media for photographers. So until next time, go out and create something beautiful. And I hope that we will see you again soon. 